You know how we normally warm up before we turn on the like actual recording? I'm always warm. Yeah. Something big happened. I need to talk about it. Okay, I'll quit screwing around. What's up? Chuck Yeager blocked me on Twitter. <laughs> Yeah, dude. <laughs> I'm I'm talking about the Chuck Yeager. Like, broke the sound barrier, Chuck Yeager. Yeah, well, somebody who broke the sound barrier wouldn't be wrong, so what did you do? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, he tweeted a picture of himself from back in the day in a, in a picture of himself on his last active duty flight, right? And I'm like, that's awesome, because he's like my favorite follow on Twitter. By far. Have, do you follow Chuck Yeager on Twitter? No. I think Chuck Yeager is super from what I remember from eighth grade history or science class or something. Oh my I, I, didn't, I wouldn't the, have known that he was on Twitter. It, it stings anew. I was going to I was gonna pull up his uh, his page and just read you how awesome his tweets are, but I can't. Really? I'm what, is, what does it say? Oh, I'm you're blocked. blocked. Yeah. What does it say when you're blocked? Does it just say you can't view this because you were bad or you were blocked from following at Gen Chuck Yeager, General Chuck Whoa. Yeager, and viewing General Chuck Yeager's tweets. Do you think General <laughs> Chuck Yeager did that to you himself? I know like he some... did because oh. there was a brief private conversation before it happened. What? <laughs> it is the worst day ever, man. <laughs> oh, what have God. you done? Okay, so I saw the picture of him. And nobody, listen, Chuck Yeager, nobody mess with him. I'm going to tell this. Can I pull that third chair up for a second? Yeah, 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 yeah. Hey, guys, don't mess with Chuck Yeager. Just don't, all right? Let him, don't don't say anything about this to him. He's a cool guy. Anyway, pushing the chair back away. Here's what happened. So I saw a picture of him. I would tell you which one it was, but I can't see his tweets anymore. Oh, because you got blocked? Yeah, I did. Thanks. It was one of his most recent uh, tweets, and and he was wearing a watch back in the the fifties, I guess it was, when he broke the sound barrier. I don't know what picture it was. It was just an old picture, and um, I was like, that looks like because because Brady and I we like watches and we like talking to each other about watches, and I was like, that looks a lot like Brady's Speedmaster, the ones that the, the Apollo astronauts wore, and so I asked General Chuck Yeager on Twitter. I said. Sir, what kind of watch do you wear? Because I was like, man, whatever Chuck Yeager wears, I would like to get a watch like he wears, right? Whatever it is, barring it, it being astronomically expensive or anything like that. And he said, none. Why? And I said, I saw the old picture of you wearing a, a watch, and I just thought it was neat, and I, I wanted to know what it was. It's an honor to talk to you, sir. Like I had my hat in my hand in the tweet. I was like, it's an honor, Yeah, I can sir. picture it. Yeah. Your filthy blue hat. Exactly. And... um. And then I, I just monitored for about 10 or 20 minutes, and he never replied. And I was like, oh, okay, well, well, that was cool while it lasted, you know. I actually interacted with a man that broke the speed, you know, broke the sound barrier for the first time. And uh, so then I went to bed. And then I woke up, and I was checking my tweets in the shower, because that's what I do. It's not weird. <laughs> There's a direct message from Chuck Yeager, General Chuck Yeager. And I was like, holy cow. I was like, it is the, this is when, I mean, how does this happen? I'm directly communicating with the man, right? What were you imagining the message was going to be? I, I don't know. I don't know. I was just really excited to see direct message from Chuck Yeager. Maybe was, like, hey, Destin, I'm a huge fan of your internet content. We should make a lot of videos together soon. Do you think we could possibly do an interview? I was, you know, in your dream, you dream, right? You dream about things like that. Or just be friends. Yeah. Do you like swings? I just thought it'd be cool to go sit on a swing set and wanna, take in, wanna throw take a in the, the end of the yard? day and talk about life. All right, so this is the deal. But it wasn't that? Please remove the tweet about the watch. I'm not endorsing brands, and I don't want brands on my site. Thanks. And I was like, completely reasonable request. Yeah, I'll go delete yeah, that. Sure, okay. So I went and found my tweet, and I deleted it, and I was like, okay, cool. And I'll just go make sure I've deleted everything. And then I went to look at the site, and I was blocked. And but that was it. My soul. It's hard, Matt. This is this is a hard thing for me. <laughs> well, yeah, I could see that. You know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of the uh, 
you know, no matter what you think about Elon Musk, right, it reminds me of the interview that some reporter did because, you know, some astronauts uh, testified before Congress about uh, SpaceX and some of these commercial uh, uh, spacecraft manufacturers. Were you aware of this? Okay. Pro- no, I, I didn't know that. All right. So, do they, like, are they, do they have a gripe with it? Yeah. Yeah. Basically, you know, they're, they're NASA guys and th- they think NASA should be in the business of making these spacecraft. But, I mean, the whole point of NASA funding these commercial these commercial entities is to to increase you know the number of rockets in America, which I'm pro rockets in America. Okay, and so it's clever. Anyway, so this yeah, private sector is dumb. Anyway, <laughs> I'm with those guys. So this journalist is interviewing Elon Musk, and he's like turning the screws to him. He's like, "Yes, yeah, so uh, Neil Armstrong hates you. How do you feel about that?" <laughs> That's not what he said, but he pretty much said that. And uh, you can just see the pain in Elon Musk's eyes. He's like, "Yeah, that was that was that was hard." I did. I I didn't like seeing that. I wish they'd come visit the plant sometime. That's what it. That's what it felt like. It's like, oh man, one of your ab, absolute heroes. Just like, nah, I ain't got time for you. That hurt, man. Anyway, I just needed yeah, to tell I you bet. that. I'm sorry. I know I'm kind of giving you crap a little bit because that's more fun. But <laughs> he totally is. <laughs> I would. <laughs> I would feel bad. Well, you know, like the the lady you just interviewed, the Bible lady. Karen, yeah, Karen, Karen Jobs, Karen Jobs. So, uh, the her deal is she's on the NIV board, or what's it called? The New International Version Translation Committee. And she's one of fifteen people who makes the Bible happen. Yeah, that's awesome. And uh, what if you were like, "Hey, I want to interview you," and <laughs> she's like, "Nah, block." <laughs> That would be more understandable than what happened to you, to be honest, <laughs> because all you did, hello, sir. I liked your nifty watch, mister. Uh-huh. Delete your compliment. Goodbye forever. <laughs> like there's absolutely no warning. It's just, this oh. is like the, the weird dog in the corner of the room that you're like, Hey, what's Mr. What's Mr. Wrinkles doing over here? And then you just get bit for no good reason. I, have, so I don't know. Maybe he was just having a bad day. I have fantasized about interviewing him or just communicating with one of the aerospace heroes uh you know <laughs> of in, whatever okay but I like if you had this. the option to not interact with buzz aldrin or get punched by buzz aldrin which one would you take <laughs> it's an excellent question um <laughs> not interact with buzz aldrin or get punched by buzz aldrin i don't know i'd probably I'd probably choose to not interact with Buzz Aldrin. He's a little different. You know, have you ever have you ever gone on a trip with someone and, you know, you're all having a bunch of fun and you, ta- you you're very careful to take a bunch of pictures of them having fun at the thing you're doing, but they don't reciprocate? Have you ever done that? Yeah, then afterwards they're like, I don't really like hanging out with you that much. I can picture it vaguely. It's like that, but going to the moon. That's what happened to Neil, <laughs> to Neil Armstrong. The only picture of Neil Armstrong... On the moon oh. is the reflection in Buzz Aldrin's visor when Neil Armstrong was taking a yes. picture of Buzz Aldrin. Yeah. Oh, that's maybe maybe you told me that. Uh, have we talked about that before? I don't think so. So anyway. the point of all this is that if you went on a road trip with Buzz Aldrin, you wouldn't take any pictures of him. <laughs> I think you're right. No, here here's a question I have a legit question, um, and I have an answer, and I will only reveal the answer if you and every single person listening promises not to reveal my secret so oh that sounds airtight yeah yeah will will you promise on behalf of everyone i I feel like i'm in a position to do that (laughs) and therefore i do so i'll reveal the secret in a few minutes but i'm going to start with a question to you who is the one person that follows you on twitter that you privately think to yourself i do not deserve to be followed on twitter by this person Uh, just the fact that you would ask that question means that you have a whole group to pick from? No. No, there's just <laughs> one person that comes to mind. There's, there's a few people that I'm like, oh, wow, you know, like, we're not worthy, Wayne's World kind of stuff. But there's one person that every once in a while, I just go back and check to make sure they're still following me. <laughs> <laughs> it's bad. Wow. Do you have anybody like that? I don't picture you being... Like, one of the first things we talked about, you and I... Was you kind of thumping the chest about how not social media obsessive you are? 
I know, but there's like, this yeah, one exception to this rule, out, and it's whatever. the it's the goofiest thing in the world that I can't explain okay. it. So, is there anybody? No, like I'm going that? over here. Well, Emily Grassley follows me, and that doesn't make a lick of sense. She's mega rocket animal taxonomy genius from the fanciest museum ever. So here's the deal. Uh, you know, years ago, I went and did that American Idol thing. Oh, whoa, well, yeah, I remember that. Wasn't that? Is 2015. 2015, it was on TV. They let me do acoustic levitation on the show, which was really neat, right? The fact that With they, the American Idol contestants? Yes, Ford allowed me to do that, and it was really, really cool. Did you sing? I, no, I did, I did not. Lame. Um, however, something that happened at that event, and I have no idea why, seriously, do not, nobody mess this up for me. This is my, my secret little thing. Dude, don't talk about it. We can still cut this out. Somehow J-Lo follows me. What? <laughs> I don't know. Dude, she has gold and rose petals in her toilet. I, no, she doesn't. I think that's true. <laughs> yeah, she totally follows me, dude. Wasn't she an in-living color dancer? I don't... Dude, all I know... I'm pretty sure. She, she's got... She's following 1,700 people, and she has 45 million followers, and she does not know she follows me. I have no idea. I, it might have been like her PR crew or something like, oh, at the event... We're going to make sure that we follow all the people that are on the show tonight. Therefore, somehow she follows me and she doesn't know it. That Okay. What did you say that ratio was? She has 45 million followers and she follows oh. 1,700 people. And somehow she, like, I think she accidentally followed me one night or something. Or it was in a contract or something. I don't know. Dude, she was a backup dancer for New Kids on the Block. Was she really? She was in a movie with Steven Dorff. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. I don't. Did, did she reply to stuff? Have you just shot her a note asking her about her watches? Dude, shut up, man. <laughs> I am I'm trying com- to help. I am completely. Um, what's the word? I, it's like I'm I'm at the party, and I'm just kind of sitting in the back. Like maybe nobody will notice me and kick me out of this party. That's kind of how this is. You know what I mean? <laughs> Do you, so you've never interacted at all? No. Why would you? Why would I do that, Matt? Well, okay. So did was she a part of American Idol for like what two, three years, maybe? I don't know, man. Quit asking okay, hard so, questions. Okay, so but she. I don't know these okay, things. I'm sorry. So how would she? How does she know who you are? Like, I, I don't know. Nothing personal. Like you're good at stuff, and I, I know a lot of people know who you are because that happens when we go places. But. I was on the show that night. That one night, I was on that show, and it, I was sleep deprived because we had to shoot the video and we had to edit it and we had to like give it to Fox or I think it was Fox. Yeah, Fox. We had to give it to them in in like 48 hours. So editing a smarter every day in 48 hours is really hard. So I didn't sleep. And I've been there with you when you did that once. It's crazy, right? Yeah. And so. Anyway, I woke up the next day and J-Lo was following and I was like, what is this? <laughs> well, th- that video, by the way, I mean, it, it was good. You did a cool thing. I mean, you're kind of a re- repeating an experiment that a lot of people know about. So it was on brand, but not like you weren't discovering a brand new thing that right. you'd never thought about before. So it was a little different that way. But just to have a whole bunch of camera people there, and I assume there were probably boom mics, like it looks... It's so interesting to see you smarter every day, every day with in, incredibly attractive TV singer people with a bunch of camera angles and all of that. It feels weird. Yeah, it was. It was kind of interesting. I'll say it that way. The, uh, you know, they wanted me to like act or whatever. And I was like, no, I, I'm legit going to teach these people how to run this acoustic levitator. And then we're just going to run it. And that's what we did. Wait, was, did they give you lines? <clears throat> No, they didn't give me lines. They just like, do your thing, man. They, no, they were pretty good. They were pretty good about it, but they were, you know, I, I had the option of acting like I was teaching people, but I chose not to. I was like, let's just do this. And they actually learned the Laplace equation for a water drop, the pressure inside a water drop, and we did it. It was neat. Yeah, it came off well. But but you're I, missing the point, Matt. I know I'm missing the point. Is, it, is the point J-Lo? What do you do? I mean... Like, I've got, I don't know. So I guess the, ultimately this is the question. J-Lo or Chuck Yeager? What, what do you choose? <laughs> well, this isn't hard at all. I mean, you take the the affirmation that, that comes, fr- yeah, 
you just take what you got, man. Bottom line is the Chuck Yeager ship has sailed. I know. You and him, you're done. That was a tough breakup. There's no looking back. And you can just, you can regret everything about your life to this point and be sad about it forever. You can just say, you know what? Forget that guy. What did he ever do? But J-Lo. What did he ever do besides break the sound barrier with broken ribs? Yeah, whatever. If you're into that, that's cool and that's great. If Way you're I into, see it, you know, He dissed my physics. friend on Twitter. That uh, offsets all of it. Anyway, well, thanks for I being really in my corner. She, I really think she puts gold and rose petals in her toilet. Okay, so just for the record, what's your Twitter account? Matt, Matt Whitman TMBH. You have two. What are yours? At Smarter Every Day and at Destin Sandlin. That was a selfish plug, obviously, because uh, I'm trying to replace the hole in my heart that only Chuck Yeager can fill. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, I think those are extreme lyrics. Yeah, I, I feel a little bit of that. Have you had any other Twitter calamities? Oh, man. You know? Uh, I, I don't know. Have you ever deleted tweets? Uh, yes, I have. Which ones? Uh, oh, I'm not sure. I, like every now and then I'll throw something out and it just doesn't draw the reaction I was hoping for. Not in terms of scope, but in terms of the tone that people to, you know put to it. And then the hive mind takes over. Yeah. And people are like, that was mean. Like, no, it wasn't actually mean at all. There's, there's no butt of the joke. No one's being criticized. Okay, I'm just going to make that go away while I still can. Yep. Yep, but for the most part, I just let it live out there and whatever. Twitter's an interesting thing because um, it's it's almost like a tattoo. It's a it's a permanent reminder of a temporary feeling. You know what I mean? Okay, tattoo, permanent reminder of a. I don't have a tattoo, so I'm having to kind of think this through a little bit. You get what okay. I, I see what you're doing there. I see what you're doing. But like you know, you can delete a tweet, but there are there are pages or websites that archive tweets as we're sitting here talking i'm casually scrolling j-lo's twitter feed <laughs> what are you finding i don't know it's just it's it's clearly not her it's clearly handled by somebody else so we just really need to not tell them that she follows me okay i need to shut twitter so yeah I don't what about the twitter bots out. lately man have you um have you seen an uptick in followers that aren't real yes yeah um I have, and when I very first started out, that was solicited. I was like, oh, cool, like, this is some kind of thing where, like, like I don't really have any presence on social media, but, like, you follow people, and they follow you back, and so, like, like early on, before I knew anything about internetting and didn't really care, because, like, oh, cool, like, I, look, I'm followed by somebody who loves Japanese street racing. Well, <laughs> that seems like a strange connection, but... Okay. Well, this one here is all in Arabic. I'm sure that's a lovely language. I don't feel like we have a ton in common. And and then every now and then I would just notice these like um like these mass disappearances. Hmm. Like, oh, well, I got I got some fake followers here. I'm glad they all just dissolved into nothing. That's positive. But yeah, I've been hearing a lot of people talking about Twitter being all over the map in terms of who you're connected with right now. What are your favorite bots that you... Do you follow any bots? I like Emo Kylo Ren. Well, it's not a bot. I mean, it's a, it's like obviously just a parody fake account. I like those kind of things a lot. I do too. There, there's one that I follow called at year progress, year underscore progress. And it's just ASCII art of a line chart or bar chart of the progress of the year. Right now, we're 15% through the year. It's It's really fun because it just shows up randomly in your Twitter feed. And another one I follow is, uh, I think it's Endless Screaming. Let me find it. <laughs> what? Yeah, it's Endless Screaming, and it's at infinite underscore scream. And what's so funny about that one is it's just a a a a a a a h h h h h h h <laughs> But it's different numbers of A's and H's, and it <laughs> it tweets every 10 minutes. <laughs> And what's so funny is... It, why? Why do I like it? Why would that be... I don't know. Because internet. Because it's free. Because you can. It's followed by 38,000 people right now. Why I like it is... What? Yeah, it's because um, if you see a tweet and you're like, oh no, that's going to start World War Three. <laughs> no doubt, 
endless screaming will be the next tweet right after it. <laughs> yeah, I suppose that brings balance to things. When I started on YouTube, I did like a three month run up. So this is before I knew you. And I was doing research on uh, some, I don't know, some community, YouTube discussions, dot something, whatever. And really made an effort to connect with people and listen and try to get a sense. But it's all blind leading the blind. I mean, nobody had any idea what was going on there. It's like, you know, four subscriber gamer channel giving advice to an eight subscriber gamer channel it is terrible. But the people were friendly enough or whatever. And I ran into this, this one dude whose channel I actually really liked. And he was just getting started. And then I launched mine and we kind of kept track of each other a little bit. And his channel, what was it called? I'm pretty sure I'm getting this story right. I think it was called Squeal Cat. <laughs> and all he would do was he would dress up his cat like a character in a famous music video or song and then just meow the tune of the song loudly. So like the Pirates of the Caribbean video was like, I'm Googling like this a, right now. I don't believe you. I think it's a thing. I, I haven't checked in on this in years. I don't know if it still exists. It's probably blown up because it was incredible. <laughs> Pirates of the Caribbean cover by Squill Cat. Yeah, okay. Caribbean. What's wrong with you? <laughs> I, I, look, the guy has, this guy has like 3,000 subscribers. And I remember he started publishing this. And I'm like, I, uh, uh, my name's Matt Whitman. I'm, I have a very important YouTube channel. I'm going to talk about the risen Lord Jesus and the importance of the Bible and Western civilization and philosophy. Oh, I got another subscriber. Thanks, mom. And so like, I remember when it got to a hundred and I was like, this is amazing. I'm going to go see how Squeal Cat guy is doing. And he's got like hundreds of thousands of views on his shrieking cat videos. Dude. And it was really, it was really good for getting my, um, my sense of self-importance in check. That, that's, I think that's what Chuck Yeager did for me. He was like, no, denied. Oh, man. God, there's something about the buildup to the Pirates of the Caribbean covered by Squirrel Cat that just does it for me, man. And the cat is just... The cat. He's not doing anything. This is just a dude shrieking into a microphone for no reason. Not all that different from what we're doing right now. He's doing a fantastic job, though, man. Yeah, he really is. He really is. Man, yeah. Okay. okay. Bless that squeal cat. Man, that that's just what I needed, Matt. The I needed to be introduced to squeal cat to get me over uh, whatever you want the the block. The complete shame and humiliation of being publicly blocked by General Chuck Yeager, your hero. Destined from the block. This is kind of like Jenny from the block. You see what I did there? <laughs> I did. <laughs> did work. And well. I want to give you a courtesy laugh, but, but it's bad. <laughs> the bar was set high by squeal cat, and I just can't. <laughs> Hey, this episode of No Dumb Questions is brought to you by KiwiCo, and that is a new sponsor, but it's not a new company to Destin and I. We and our families have been a huge fan of KiwiCo for a really long time. We tried it out, and it was just a no-brainer that this was something that was going to continue to be a part of the rhythm of our lives with our kids, because we put a lot of time and thought into stuff that induces wonder in our kids. It's why we try to travel whenever we can. It's why we read books together. It's why we like documentaries and nature stuff. We want everything about the world to be exciting and interesting for them. And KiwiCo gets that. They have four different kinds of little wonder inducing creativity crates. And they're all age appropriate for different levels of development. And you're smart. You can go to their website, kiwico.com slash NDQ and pick out whatever makes sense for, for you and the kids in your life. It's like Christmas every time something from KiwiCo shows up and the kids rip everything open and tear into it. Actually, why am I telling you about this? My kids are here. Hang on a sec. I'm going to go get them and I'm going to let them tell you why this is awesome. What kind of crate do you get? I get doodle crates. It's a doodle crate? What's been your favorite one? No, tinkle crate. Tinker crate. Okay, what do you do with it? Tinkle crates, we like make a cannonball. Like a, like to shoot at stuff? Yeah. What do you make it out of? It's popsicle sticks. Which? Yeah. What kind do you get, kiddo? 
I mostly get the Tinker Crates. Okay. I just like them because they're like working things, and I like making things that actually work, and I think it's fun. All right. What about you, little girl? Which um, kind do you I get? do the Doodle Crates. Okay. What's been your favorite Doodle Crate? Um, it was probably the slippers I got to make. Oh, I remember those. Okay, okay. Tell me about how the slippers worked. So they give you all the stuff to make them, and then you sew it together, and you decorate it, and you cut out all the stuff you need, and you make slippers. Did you decorate the slippers? Uh Uh-huh. With what? Um, I made them look like raccoons. (laughs) Because why not? Were they comfortable? Uh Uh-huh. Do you still wear them? Yeah. Okay, so that's a win. So they just show up in a box. Where does that rank for you guys in terms of your favorite thing that shows up in the mail every month? Uh, I think it's I think super it's fun, the and then there's surprises exciting. too. So Where? you get them for a surprise, and you don't know which what you're going to get. You know what my favorite one was? What? The one where we did the Chinese calligraphy script with the water brush. Oh yeah, that one was fun. And we drew the panda. Mm-hmm. Yeah. My expert opinion is that they love it, and if you want something really creative and that sparks wonder in your kid, you should try this out. And if you want to do a free trial of that so you can get a sense of it for yourself, you can go to kiwico.com slash NDQ, and that'll get you a free trial to get started with any of the four different types of crates. Thanks again for supporting the sponsors. Thanks to KiwiCo for being enthusiastic about NDQ and supporting us. Let's get back to the conversation. Okay, dude, I just got back from California. Yeah, I talked to you like half a time on that whole trip. It was kind of weird. We were in the blackout zone. Did I tell you why I was there? Well, you told me why you were going, but you didn't. I haven't heard how it went or anything. In Ready Player One, the movie's coming out, as you know. In Ready Player One, there's all this technology that the user, um, you know, would have to have in order to interact with the Oasis, like mm-hmm. a, a haptic visor, or I guess it's not called a haptic visor. It's just called a visor, right? It's called an Oasis visor. Yeah, Oasis visor, and then you have like haptic gloves and haptic suit and all of that stuff. Yeah, so I wanted to do a series on Smarter Every Day about the technology required for humans to interact with VR. That's what I wanted to do. And specifically, the first video, I'm editing it right now. I have to get it out in like two days. It's on haptic gloves. What do you know about haptic gloves? I know that when we read Ready Player One like three times in order to do a review of it, that haptic gloves came up a lot in Ready Player One. The end. (laughs) So here's the deal. I will go on record to say I thought VR was stupid. Like, just stupid. Oh, no. You're coming around. Seriously? Until I put on the haptic gloves. Seriously. So I went to this company called Haptics, H-A-P-T-X, I think. Okay, seems appropriate. And the, the deal is, once they put the gloves on me, there, there was this software engineer over in the corner. His name was Adam. And I'm sitting there saying, well, when you do the gloves, and, you, and I'm asking all the questions, I'm doing the engineer thing, and he just finally shuts me up, and he said, talking about VR is like dancing about architecture. Oh. And I was like, what do you mean? I don't. I don't understand. He said exactly. Put on Just the put gloves. on the glove. <laughs> that was exactly. And so I did, and it was awesome. I could actually feel things in 3D space that in, in a 3D space that I wasn't in. Like what so, kind of things did you feel? There were rain clouds suspended from a string. Okay, can't. And I feel, just tapped on them. Feel rain clouds. I did. I just tapped on them and made them made them rain. On my sunflowers, which then grew. And then I, you know, there's this little farm scene they had, and a little fox ran out and, like, so to jumped review, in my hand. you put a bucket on your face and went into a magic, magic secret world where no one could join you, pursued a fox, and made it rain. That's exactly what happened. Well, I can <laughs> see what the application of this technology is going to be. <laughs> No, no, no. There's actually some, you know, I was the same way. I was like, this is cool and fun, and it's probably fun for like three minutes, but I don't really see the application. But then they showed me some applications. They showed me some, they showed me some training activities. That's about all I can say. 
they're like, we're going to put you in this world now and you're not allowed to, you're not allowed to explain what you're seeing or anything like that because of reasons. And I was like, okay, cool. And then they said, here's a thing and here's some tools. You would need to work on this. I was like, that's awesome. And I picked up the tools and I could feel them in my hand and I could do work on things. Okay, let's keep dancing about architecture. What do you mean you could feel them in your hand? That's that's the thing. Like if, if you were to move your hand to an object, the, the sense of touch is is stimulated by this is the way I describe it, boundary conditions. Like if you reach out right now and touch your computer I'm gonna or go the with steering the wheel or sure. whatever your your me- the manatee, whatever. If you just touch something, think about the mechanics of what's happening there. Okay. There's a reaction force that the object is putting on your body, and it's compressing the skin between your bone and that boundary condition, that thing, right? Yeah. Because we're just little meat bags. We're little meat servos, right? Watery meat bags. I like to think of it as being a little more than that, but sure, meat bag. Let's go with that. (laughs) So if you think about what's happening... You're compressing the skin in that area, and then in order to keep pushing it, you have to put muscle in that direction. So they've created a way to provide reaction force for your finger. Imagine if there was a puppet master behind your hand, and he had somehow super glued a string to each of your, your fingernails. Okay, I'd hate that. And you go to grab something, and... You know, right before you were to touch something, he were to pull on those strings. It would feel like your hands had stopped or your fingers had stopped, right? But the other thing that you feel is on the other side of your hand, you feel the compression of that skin. And so they have little bitty air bladders is what I call them. They call them tractors. It's like a little pad full of pixels, like touch pixels, that will push air up against your skin for the specific location that you're feeling. Okay, so the last time I put on anything resembling this was in 1987, when, like all kids who bought the NES, when they tried on their first power glove, and then four oh, seconds the later glove. were like, this thing's a pile of crap, and threw it aside <laughs> and maybe put it on a shelf to be ironic 20 years later. It, it was awful. It was the most disappointing thing ever, and that's kind of still what I'm picturing in my brain, but it sounds like you're describing something more carefully thought through. I had a buddy in school that wrote a song about the power glove, was and it, it was fantastic. Could you could you squeal cat it? It was like <laughs> meow 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 meow. <laughs> no, it was something along the lines of "I love my power glove." I saw that rhyme coming from a mile away. <laughs> <laughs> it was great, but it was uh, it was interesting. Everybody, the power glove was a fantastic marketing thing. Anyway, how did we get here? Where, where are we? Well, we were talking about. Creative applications of VR. Oh, yeah. We're dancing about so, architecture. It's it's the physical putting your body in the VR with just vision that's been okay, right? But as soon as I could touch things, it tricked my brain further. It, it, that's a well, weird, that's what I weird know. sentence. How much did it trick your brain? So So much that I tried to hand things to my other hand. Does that work? No, it doesn't work. I, I had a haptic glove on my right hand. I picked up a rock, and then while I was holding the rock, a little bitty toy tractor came out of the barn, and I wanted to go grab it, so I tried to hand the rock to my other hand. It didn't work. So Because you didn't have a glove on it? I didn't have a glove on oh, it, and the sense. rock wasn't real. Well, yeah, I guess, hey, I could have started <laughs> yeah. there. Thank you for yeah. the reminder. How far did the it glove was go real- up? Did it go to, like, your elbow? No, no. just It was just a glove. Just a glove. It, it had a, a cable coming off of it that had all these pneumatic tubes that went to what I believe to be the, the most important part of the system, which is this series of valves. And they wouldn't tell me how the valves work unless I signed an NDA, which I didn't want to do. But it was amazing. Did you have fun? Yeah. I actually had fun playing with a little spider that didn't exist and a little fox that didn't exist and growing some wheat. I don't know. It was so... Some some wheat? Yeah. Okay. Well, the thing is, I went full on nerd mode. So if you think about everything that goes into making your body feel like it's feeling things, it's way more complicated 
than just, hey, let me, you know, l- let me put some little pressure sensors. For example, um, there's this, I've always wondered why they do this, but there's this little test that a doctor will do with you where they have like two pencil points. Have you ever had them do this? Two pencil points. No, uh, maybe. Keep going. So they spread the pencil apart. It's like a compass, like in uh, like in school, like sure. you would draw a circle with. Mm-hmm. Imagine spreading those pencil points apart and touching your skin. And, and this is called the two-point test. There is a resolution, like a spatial resolution of your ability to sense feeling. Did you know this? I'm not even sure. I, I'm tracking as to what you... Spatial okay, so imagine, resolution of my ability it's to track really hard. Feeling. It's really hard to dance about architecture. So, so think about this. Up on your, let, let's say your shin, for example, if you were to have two pencil points and they were like an inch apart, okay, and you were to touch them against your shin, do you think you'd be able to tell that they were two points or would it feel like one point? I think it would depend on how hard you pushed. Okay. If you do the same thing on your hand, what do you think? I feel like I would know. For sure. Yeah, you would you would know. So the distribution of the nerve endings in your hands are different than your legs and different than your face, all that stuff. Hmm. Th- this is a really interesting concept that I learned about when I was there. It's called the homunculus man. Have you ever heard of the homunculus man? I have now. So it's it's a visual or a graphic representation of the density of your nerve endings in your body. Your hands have like way more nerves in them than your forearms, for example, and so the homunculus man is is drawn with the relative size of each individual part of the body, representing how many nerve endings are there. Oh, let me let me send you. A, did you Google it? That's terrifying. Looks like a goblin, doesn't it? Big lips. But think about it, and then big hands, a little bit bigger feet, really small shins and, and calves. Isn't that interesting? And that's really unattractive. Yeah. So, but think about that. That is the challenge that these guys have. They're trying to trick your body into thinking that all of those nerves down in the hand actually exist. So, my question for you, it, this this might be hard, but what questions would you have about a haptic glove because I'm I'm editing the video like right now. Like what do you want to know about a haptic glove? Uh, I want to know if you forget that it's on. Like is it so heavy that it distracts from the experience because it changes the way your arm and torso interacts with things? Cuz that would take me right out of the reality of the moment in a hurry, I imagine. Huh. I would want to know how delicately you can feel stuff. Like most of the really intricate things that we do in life involve a pretty a pretty deft touch and the larger, more powerful motions we do don't require such a deft touch. So I kind of wonder where we're at in the game in terms of relative to like the evolution of the touch screen. I remember the early ones where you had to mash on them and finesse wasn't part of the Mm -hmm. deal. And now like on my note eight, it's a technological wonder. It it knows when I didn't mean to touch something. Really? Yeah. It's, it feels like it's that kind of precise. I'm so excited about the Samsung I'm about to get. They're they're about to come out. I'm about, I'm gonna get one. You're, you're gonna, so are you gonna miss your dongle? <laughs> no, no, not gonna miss the dongles. I'm no. excited about that. So so that's a really good question. And and they had an answer for that. They had this simulation when they were first trying to tell you know if they were doing it right, where they had a hand palm up and and you had these sensors that you put your hand against. And you could pick up different objects in the simulation and put them in your hand. Like you could pick up an apple and put it in your hand. And you could pick up a snowball and put it in your hand. Did it feel like an apple? Yes, it did. It actually did. And it felt different than, you know, just a. they had this metal block and they'd put the metal block in your hand. And here's the thing. It would feel different in terms of temperature as well. What? Because if you have, yeah. Let's say you had a block of aluminum and you had a block of wood and they were both sitting in the same room all day long and they were both 72 degrees Fahrenheit or 25 degrees Celsius, whatever whatever floats your boat, and you touch both of them, which one would feel cold? Well, sure, I would think, I would think the metal would feel cold on your hand. 
but they're the same temperature. So why yes. would they feel cold? I've wondered that. It's because of thermal conductivity. It's because the, the metal is sapping the heat out of your hand faster. The last 15 seconds of this found it sounded like a, like a scripted children's science show. I'm sorry. <laughs> like, Gee, I've wondered that a lot, Mr. Destin. If only someone knew. Well, as a matter of fact, young American, there is a reason for that. Did I go into professor voice? No, 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 you didn't. I'm just saying that same script with professor voice. Like we could just make a PBS show out of that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. No, you I just get really wrong. excited about it. And so later on, we went and got something to eat with the engineers after. And they were like, you know, it, it, I got some feedback on what it's like to be on the other end of Destin coming in and filming a smarter every day. And they were like, I thought you were going to come in and like have a script and like set up lights and stuff, but you really just walk in and you're an engineer and want to know things. That's how that works, isn't it? I was like, yeah, I really do want to know. That's how that works. Anyway, it's fascinating. I'm making the video. It'll be out in a little bit. I was just, but you went and looked at other stuff too, didn't you? Not just the gloves. I did. Um, I I looked at something else, and I'm hesitant to say what that thing oh, is because that, that video is going to come out later, closer to when Ready Player One comes out, the the movie. Okay. It it's another piece of gear that you would use to interact with the Oasis. I don't know. We're getting all the way back to the Velt, aren't we? Well, yeah, and that's kind of an interesting thing that one of our first conversations on the podcast was about the Velt, and kind of the highlight of our conversation from last summer was basically about a futuristic version of the Velt Mm -hmm. set in a slightly different context. And now here we are again, ramping up for the Ready Player One movie, which we're going to, right? Yeah, you're going to be here in Alabama for that, right? Who are you going to dress up as? (laughs) I'm going to dress up as Sorrento. Oh. No, no, I I think I should go as Leopardon. (laughs) Leopardon. Okay, all right, I can respect that. Would it be okay if I went as Ultra Magnus, even though he, he he wasn't in the book? Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. You can go as Ultra Magnus. Do it. Be great. Or what Bilbo. Is the, what is the thing that you and uh, Bob were talking about that he had? Yeah, uh, Ultra Magnus is. Well, no, Ultra Magnus couldn't open it. You're talking about the Autobot Matrix of Leadership. Yeah, that of course. Ultra Speaking Magnus wasn't qualified to open it. Speaking Only of leadership, an Autobot of true character. <laughs> yeah, it was. It just wasn't meant for him. I don't think Chuck Rod. Yeager would let me open that either. Oh man! I know. Every I was once really in a while hoping that you me. were forgetting. It hits me like a wave every so often. Um, yeah, let's, a wave of rejection and disappointment and feeling like, well, you still really haven't arrived. Yeah, I know. I don't say that to make it hurt more. I say that to clarify the feelings you should be feeling. This episode of No Dumb Questions, and I guess every episode of No Dumb Questions, is brought to you in part by those of you who support us on Patreon. So, as always, a huge thank you to all of those listeners who decided to go ludicrously above and beyond the normal commitment level for just listening to a couple of dudes talk on a podcast and actually went over to patreon.com slash no dumb questions and decided to to kick in support on what we're doing with our little program. Thanks for the encouragement. Thanks for the support. If you want to be a part of supporting the program, you can do that at patreon.com slash no dumb questions. If that's not something that you're into, I'm just really glad you listened to this and thanks for being here. All right. Let's get back to the conversation. It's time for the book, Matt. It's time to tell people. Yes, it is. You want to announce it? I would love to. Tough. We're going to it's read Ender's Game. Ender's Game. <laughs> it's Ender's Game. It's Ender's Game. That's the book. Ender's Game by... <laughs> Cut me off. Orson Roger Scott Card. <laughs> Enderman. I don't know who wrote that. Do you know who wrote that? Orson Scott Card. That's what I was going to say. The book is fantastic, dude. I mean, it's... It is really really good and yeah it's fantastic so i highly recommend it which is why we're gonna do it please is that okay (laughs) yes no i'm in i'm in i I think it sounds fun yeah so i everyone agrees that the movie's not that great but the book oh dude it's it's fantastic the what's so interesting about the book especially the audiobook is the guy that reads it his voice at first when you hear it you're like whoa that is a voice actor what's going on and then you quickly meld into it and it's pretty it's pretty amazing he does a good job with it so i like it a lot Okay, so we're probably like four episodes, a couple months out from Ender's Game. Probably, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Let's do it. All right, call it an announcement. Ender's Game it is. Okay, I'm checking out the iTunes reviews. It's It's been a while since I've looked at these. We have 666 five-star reviews. That's haunting. Hopefully <laughs> yeah, we'll no. get that. 
rectified. Yeah, I know. Come on, Matt's mom, get this together. And then, um, but we've got 703 ratings, but it averages out to be a five. So um, thank you, everyone who's taken the time no to write a review. Kidding. I would love it if more people did that. That'd be great. It would be super duper helpful. And I, I like to read the reviews. They're pretty fun. Could so. you read me the worst one? <laughs> Why would you want me to do that? <laughs> That's where the fun happens. Well, <laughs> but you're you're encouraging people to leave. Yes, I'll read it to you. All right. Yeah. Please don't leave reviews like this. Okay. Here it says, just <laughs> unrepentant <laughs> Finian Piper says. I don't know what that means. I don't either. Just suffered through ninety minute podcast of Matt and Destin rambling on about a number of subjects <laughs> while promoting a website they encourage you to not visit. <laughs> <laughs> that's actually that's like we should just. Control C, Control V that into the podcast description because somebody just that? knocked it out of the park. I was hoping for a more substantial episode without all the gushing over each other. I'm unsubscribing immediately. One out of three listeners found this review helpful. <laughs> oh, oh, man, somebody found that helpful. Come on. Dude. That's the only part that offends me. Golly. I don't, like You're good at stuff, man. I, I, I don't man. know. I, I don't want it to be uncomfortable for people. I just, I just respect you so much. Oh, my gosh. What? Oh, okay. Yeah, I wouldn't say that back to me. This even... next one is, dang, it says, it really it's helps us show... It really reciprocate, but it doesn't matter, whatever. The next to last says, it really helps show Destin's personality. Latest podcast has some pretty sexist elements over Destin's business cards. What? What? Oh, your business cards that are different for boys and girls? Oh, my gosh. Like, I suspect he doesn't understand what he does is wrong. His partner <laughs> really supports the show. What? Ah, oh, hey, I like that one. Oh. Thank you. You know <laughs> what? I'm here to kind of just clean up the mess. S and signed Chuck things. Yeager. <laughs> 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 oh, man. <laughs> All right, so if you're interested in leaving a review on iTunes, we would really appreciate it. We actually read those, so thank you. Yeah, and they're nice. Thank you. Agreed. I've got some stuff from the r slash NDQ subreddit. You want to respond to a couple of these? Yeah. Yeah, uh, hit me with them right. cold. How does Destin or Matt organize their productivity, asks the spear. How do we organize our productivity? I do it on a week-by-week -week basis, personally. Last like couple right months, now, you've just been winging it. Yeah, it's been pretty rough. It's been pretty rough. Um, that's what I do. What about you? A lot of what I do just requires thought. A bunch of my productivity is just needing mental space to not have other things going on and think about stuff. So I'm productive with my in-between time, driving time, thinking time. If I'm standing in the shower, I'm thinking about stuff. If I'm fishing, I'm thinking about stuff, organize up some thoughts. And then I've got some goofy little gimmicks that I learned in like elementary school from some guest speaker who came and talked about thinking like this. And I what? still use them to this day in what terms of organizing. Oh, I got hmm. a, I got a ton. You, uh, Okay, here's an example. In terms of history, all of the different centuries have a slightly different color. Like my my mental image of everything from the time of Jesus on, so you know, 21 centuries, it's like a color spectrum that moves from like a parchment color up to a very vibrant blue for right now. And the color kind of morphs along the way. Really? So, yeah, so, so then when, when I learn new stuff... Is it, it like just synesthesia? Goes into a corresponding color and it kind of sticks there. And that's not even a completely accurate description because the colors aren't that neatly mapped, but I can picture the colors of the centuries of history. And like the, the days of the week have a certain kind of color pattern to them in my brain and a certain shape in my brain. So I try to remember things that I need to do if I don't have my calendar handy by putting them in that part of the shape or the ellipse that is the week to me. Qu question. So. If you were to, start, let's say, 500s, what color in your brain are the 500s? Red. Oh, so it's not like you start at parchment and then you work your way up to blue and it's it's a saturation gradient. It's There are different colors along the way. Right. We're, we're, I, yes, thank you for clarifying. Yeah, it migrates through different colors. Maybe I associate them with the colors of whatever empire was important or... Yeah, I couldn't even tell you why. I just, I, I have colors... And they're not, it's not like a hard block where like the 500s are this clean, bright YouTube red 
and then the next one's a totally different color it, it, i mean it it fades between colors and so you can kind of put stuff on the border between colors and remember that that's where it goes to which block in your brain is the most full mm, they're different full because i feel like i know quite a bit about the last hundred years but i know it different than i know stuff about the first century obviously i work with the bible a lot so i study a lot of extra biblical first century ad history and you know I'm interested in the philosophy of the Middle Ages, so I think about that a lot. I think the emptiest would be the 10th century, and I think the fullest, in terms of just knowing history, not just remembering stuff that happened yesterday, would probably be first and second, maybe 16th and 17th, and then I feel like 19th, 20th, 21st are just cheating because they're recent. What about Hmm. you? Oh, I mean, I don't even have a structure like this in my mind, so this is fascinating to me. No, I, I, I don't even deserve a seat at the table in this discussion, but it is, it is very interesting. Numbers are kind of like that to me. Well, that's what I was going to ask. How do you? I mean, because you got a whole batch of formulas that float around in your brain. How do you know them? So I don't have colors. I have sharpnesses. This is the only way I've, I've figured out to describe it. Brady Heron did a video one time about people's favorite numbers, and my favorite number is twenty-one. And the reason is because three is a very sharp number in my brain, and seven is a very sharp number in my ma- in my brain. So if you were to like multiply those two together, then twenty one is the ultimate sharpness. I have no idea how to describe it other than that, but twenty one is the number for me because of that reason. Huh? Yeah, but I mean formulas and stuff like that. I try to understand what I'm doing, like what the formula means, and then I can kind of remember it. And some of them just sound fun, like PL over IE, you know, things like that. So, yeah, uh, several, uh, lots of things like that have a rhythm to them, and that rhythm is how they stick. I have little acrostics that, you know, I did in school to remember certain lists of things that I still use to this day. What's but, your favorite acrostic? Um, I have one that I use to remember the the brooks that come into the east side of the Jordan River. What? Yeah, it's uh, Y Jazz. So you've got uh, okay. Can I still do this? Uh, Yarmuk. <laughs> uh, uh, I can't come up with them anymore. Uh, Arnon, Zared Brook. What's the J? <laughs> No, oh, okay. I just said it worked and then it totally didn't work. But I mean, we're talking about like, <laughs> we're talking about these J is Jabbok. So we're talking about like four little rivers or brooks that don't really matter. But I had to know this in seminary at one point for just like a geography of the Holy Land thing. And so I memorized this acrostic and then I can't always remember the name, but I remember it's Y, J, Starts with a, Z. a <laughs> Z going down. And then I can, I can put things geographically in between each of those sets of rivers to remember what goes where. And so that, again, it's a little structure to hang new ideas or new locations on. That's the concept. That's awesome. That's really, really cool. Do, do you happen to know the, um, the trigonometric identities? I don't think so. Really? I don't know what, I don't know what that means. Like sine, cosine, tangent. Oh, 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 uh, yeah. The stuff I spaced out on, uh, I knew that once well enough to pass a test and then I forgot it. Really? You don't know any of them. I no, I'm sorry. I like to try to come off as someone competent, but mm. Oscar had a hunk of apples. Sokotoa, none of this. Wait, 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 wait. I didn't learn. Wait, do it again. Sine, cosine, tangent. Sine is opposite over hypotenuse. You you don't have these. Cosine no. is adjacent over hypotenuse, and tangent is opposite over adjacent. What? How do you remember yeah. the order of Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians? A song. Really? Oh, yep. yeah. Yeah. For me, it's go eat popcorn. <laughs> How do you remember the notes on the treble clef? Uh, I, I don't do music. <laughs> Every good boy does fine. Well, those oh, are the lines. Easter bunnies go dancing at Easter. See? Is, there it works. No, that, that that's the strings on guitar. Easter bunnies go dancing at Easter. Is that right? Oh, weird. That Easter? No, that's yeah. not right. Oh, is it not? Well, okay. No, no, no. Okay. Yeah, if you're going the other way. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. Cool. Go dancing anyway, yeah, at Easter. My roommate in college told me that, but I don't play guitar. But I that's really all I know. Anyway, that was a fun You know question. what we should do? 
What? We should start a thread right now in the subreddit uh-huh. where we ask people for their favorite little mnemonic devices like that. Oh, because yeah, we are going to learn a crap ton just from reading through that thread. A metric crap ton, which is oh, a little bit bigger than an imperial crap ton. It's a tick yeah. more. Sure, it is. Sure. It is. It's a. It's yeah. It's a, a metric tick more. Oh, so That's it, right. So the question was just, uh, how do we stay organized or be productive? And my answer would be, try to organize my thought space so that when I have fingers to keys and I need to write or produce content, it's very easy for me to access what I already put the thought into and just get it out on paper. I'm a little more brute force. I just figure out what has to be done and I put that fire out first, and then I turn my attention to other fires. And then if there's any if there's any, you know, anything that I can't accomplish through normal human powers, then I just choose not to sleep till it's done. That's how I do it. Ah, uh, that is how you do it. I don't know yeah. how much longer that's going to work for you, buddy. Yeah, I know. The human body can only accommodate that for so long. Uh, it can. Oh, here's one from yeah. Simon Danziger that just says Nick Saban. And if I go in here and look at it, this guy says, I'm a huge Miami Dolphins fan. And Nick Saban was a great big jerk to the Miami Dolphins, I'm summarizing. But Destin called him a true leader. True leaders don't lie to the face of their team and supporters. Dot, 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 just saying. What do you have to say about that, Mr. Alabama? Uh, I think you know exactly what I have to say about that. Is it Roll Tide? It's Roll Tide. (laughs) (laughs) Dale Jr. No, no, no. I actually don't don't know about this. Um, So I need to go research it so that I can be informed. He had a brief little stint in the NFL. It didn't go well with the Dolphins. Mm -hmm. And his departure was pretty scandalous because like one day he's in deny, deny, deny. No, 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 we're doing, you know, I'm I'm here, blah, blah, blah mode. And then like the next day he was gone. Oh, really? Yeah. I'm out. He pulled the ejection shoot. Yes. So my answer to that is Simon Danziger, I will go inform myself. That's so gracious. You're supposed to fight. And then I will choose to never forget and hold people's sins against them forever like the internet does. <laughs> you, you noticed that lately? Lately? It's, sir, um, we have some traffic camera uh, footage from you in New Orleans in 1983. It appears that you swerved to hit a squirrel. Therefore, we're going to try to get you fired from your job today, <laughs> or whatever it was. It's Which we, do you do you remember the the civics principle of no ex post facto laws? Have we talked about this? No. What is that? It well, one of the deals with the the way the Constitution is structured is that you can't make a law and then retroactively punish someone for having violated that law before it became illegal. It's the thing that you learn about on the same day that you learn about double jeopardy in a civics class, which you can't be tried twice for the same thing. There are some nuances there. But the the no ex post facto law thing was a way to prevent abuses that happened when you had this this weird moment in like the 18th century, um, you know, where where you had parliaments and kings kind of sort of coexisting and the law was kind of murky at times. And if you had somebody who was a problem and just needed to be dealt with, you could illegalize their annoying activity and then punish them after the fact. Mm. And I feel like we're getting a wonderful living civics lesson right now in the internet age, not over one particular thing, but over kind of everything about why that restriction needs to be in place. Because otherwise, the, the mores change, things evolve a little bit culturally, and stuff you did... 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, looks a lot dumber and sometimes worser now than it did in that context. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I'm I'm with you, but uh, you're talking about laws. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what I'm saying is you don't want to give the power of law to this impulse that we're seeing on the internet over the last five or 10 years. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I mean, it's, it's one thing to get mad at people and say they should be fired. It's another thing to go and incarcerate them for violating modern social preferences 20 years ago when those weren't the preferences. Hmm. Super interesting. I I don't know. I, I just I just want to get to a place where people are cool with forgiving other people for failures um, if they're truly repentant. I want to get there. 
the most meaningful thing that's ever happened in my life is that somebody did that for me. Yeah. Now, I'm not making like some grand spiritual religious point. I just mean somebody I cared about was very forgiving toward me on occasions when I really, really needed it. And it changed yeah. my life. Yeah, I remember hearing this uh, this old story one time about this guy that was just, you know, he he was not behaving properly. And it, it wasn't like infidelity or anything like that, but he was being really bad toward his wife. And I remember him going up to his wife in this story. It was on NPR, I remember this. And he said, hey, I'm sorry, uh, will you forgive me? And she says, of course. And it was this big thing, whatever it was. I don't even remember the story, but I just remember it was a huge thing. But once he said, hey, I just realized the error of my ways. Please forgive me. Of course. I was like, wow, hmm. that's pretty cool. I want to be that kind of person. The thing about forgiveness, wow, we are like crazy into this all of a sudden. The thing about forgiveness yeah. that is meaningful to me is that if forgiveness is in play where there's been some kind of violation or wronging, it means that it, there's no angle. If you're actually forgiving somebody or they're actually forgiving you, it means I, I do want good things for you. And I'm not using this to score points for whatever other secondary agenda I might have. I'm not keeping count of things you've done wrong so I can get back at you at some other point. It is very liberating and it's very outside the game. Forgiveness kind of blows up the game. Yeah. If, if I'm asking my wife to forgive me for leaving the keys on the table or whatever it is, or oh, even if it's a big offense. thing. It's a very personal example. We can edit that out later if you want. Yeah. <laughs> it kind of went to the heart of the matter there, didn't I? Or, you know, if if it's a bigger thing between two individuals, whether it be at you know, work or in a social situation, I mean, things do have to change. Right. Which I mean, you can say you're sorry all you want, but if you ain't changing, you ain't sorry. Logan Paul, for example, the big YouTuber oh. that, you know, did some crazy things and asked for forgiveness and I was like, hey, I watched the forgiveness video he made about suicide or whatever. I was like, that was pretty good. You, you know? sent me a text halfway through it. We're like, it's pretty good. Yeah, it's pretty good. And then I got to the end of it and I was like, okay, <laughs> it was self-serving. <laughs> yeah, and you sent me the next text. We're already past our LPM limits. I'm done with that. Oh, oh. <laughs> LPM. Yeah, that's what I got. Um, Long story short, I, I'm I'm in favor of the uh, of the, the judgment that came down from YouTube headquarters on uh, on that stuff. Anyway, I think it just hit me no again. Brainer. It just hit me again, Matt. What hit you? Chuck Yeager blocked me on Twitter. Oh, I'm sorry. We like my my brother's birthday dinner is in ten minutes, uh, eight minutes away. So, oh. do you have something else? Make it fast. Yeah, this will take fifteen seconds. Wade Glass asks, "Is this the end of Snapchat?" Destin, yes, no. Did the Snapchat update uh, kill it? Yeah, no doubt, <laughs> no doubt. They uh, Snapchat's over. So it's a, it's a clustery mess. I think it's done. I'm off the train. I just let my you, kids play with it and put monkey faces on them. The people that, you know, I had a lot of people that I would, I would communicate back and forth with on Snapchat. And so I'm sorry if you were one of those people and we would send stuff to each other every once in a while. I'm sorry. I can't find your messages anymore. We're going to have to migrate to MySpace. I'm, I'm on Instagram and I'm, I'm trying to interact with people on Instagram. So I, here, at Smarter Every Day on Instagram. They, you know, Instagram actually gave me at Smarter Every Day. So uh, it was, was nice not being used, and I asked for it, and they said, yes, you have the trademark. You can have it. Snapchat did not. So please message me on Instagram, at Smarter Every Day. So people, if they want to migrate from Snapchat, they can get you on Instagram, and then are you on Twitter at all? <laughs> <laughs> Going to the birthday party. Thanks, Matt. I enjoyed this, buddy. Have fun, buddy. This one was special. <laughs>